have your Bible this morning, open up to John chapter 1. Our text this morning will be verses 35 through 51. John chapter 1, 35 through 51, and if you have your place there, let's just bow and go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we know that your healing hand is in this place. And Lord, there's nowhere else we can turn but to you, to your word. Pray God that, that we would just lay those break, broken pieces at your feet. Lord, that you would you would mend and heal. The spirit, Lord. So important. We know there's a new body, a new home. But Lord, to have a broken spirit. There's nothing that we can say or do to me in broken spirits, broken hearts. Oh God, you can. And only you can. So heal the broken hearts, Lord. Put the broken pieces back together in our lives. And we, we're all broken, Lord. And we all need you every minute of every day. May we just yield ourselves to you, be renewed, be strengthened, be a testimony for you. Help me, God, to preach your word, your honor, your glory. I did not mention this in our previous <clears throat> messages uh, since we began this study in the book of John, but in John chapter 1, verse 23, when John the Baptist, we see when he comes onto the scene, uh, the narrative, uh, it's, the, it's the first day that has John the Baptist in it, recorded and by John the Apostle. But on that first day, John the Baptist says, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. And uh, and then the very next day, we see in John chapter 29, again, John the Baptist sees Jesus coming and says, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. And in verse 32, John continues, And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode on him, and I, and I knew him not. But he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said to me, Unto whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. And then verse 34, John says, I saw and I bear record, that this is the Son of God. And of course, in the Gospels we see uh, at the baptism of Jesus, the, uh, the, the Spirit of God descending like a, a dove and lighting on Him and a voice from heaven that says, Behold, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And we know that, that within the the human body of Jesus Christ, Paul tells us, dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead in that body, that Jesus Christ is God. And we come to our text now, and it's the next day after. So, so now it is the third day in this narrative 
concerning John the Baptist. And uh, John stood and two of his disciples, now this is disciples of John the Baptist, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, John said once again, Behold the Lamb of God. The eternal word of God as we saw in the beginning of this gospel was made manifest in the flesh as the Son of God. And He became manifest the Son of God so that He would be that sacrificial lamb to take away the sin of the world. The, behold, the Lamb of God. We, we looked at that in detail last week. But uh, let, me, let me bring this in mind to us. That in, in the Old Testament, in the, in the tabernacle and in the temple worship, there were always two lambs that were brought. There was one always brought in the morning, one always brought in the evening. They were sacrificial lambs. On the annual Day of Atonement, that sacrificial lamb was brought and slaughtered. And, and many, many, many other lambs and animals that had been, that were brought and they were sacrificed all throughout the Old Testament. Continuing and continuing and continuing. All these lambs that were brought. But here's the difference. Those lambs, all of them were brought by men to men to make the sacrifice. But here, the Lamb of God, it was God who brought the Lamb. It was God the Father who sent His only begotten Son and it was God the Son who said, I'll go. And He went. God the Father sent, the Son went. And He was the Lamb of God. Once and for all, no more sacrifices. No more typology. Once for all, the Lamb of God that has come to take away our sin, to restore, to put the broken pieces back together, to, re, to, to make what was wrong right, to make what was broken mended, to bring us back into fellowship with God. And once John the Baptist makes this, uh, this proclamation one more time, in this in this narrative, we we don't see him mentioned anymore. John he fades from the narrative, but not before he pointed his disciples to Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God. He told them, "Behold the Lamb of God." There he is. And then, as he said, he must increase, I must decrease. And John fades away. In verse 37, we see that these two disciples, they heard, they were followers of John. They'd been baptized by John. And when he says, behold the Lamb of God, when they heard him speak, it says that they followed Jesus. And see, believers, a genuine believers point others to Christ. No, we do not have uh, the power to say we have not been called to save people. We don't have the power to do it anyways. What we have been given is the commission 
to be that witness, to point others to Christ. And, and as we're going to see, not every believer comes to the Savior the same way. Uh, these, these first two in our text, they were pointed to Christ by the anointed messenger, by the preacher, if you would. John the Baptist preached a message of repentance and, and he was the forerunner to the Messiah that would come. And he says, there he is. There he is. Behold the Lamb of God. And his disciples heard and they followed Christ. We see when, when the Apostle Paul, when he was saved on that road to Damascus in, in Acts chapter 9, that uh, after he was in Damascus and after he received meat and he was strengthened, it says that he straightway preached Christ in the synagogue that he is the Son of God. And when we have been born again by the Spirit of God, how could we not tell others? And, we, and as I said, uh, and Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians, if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them of the lost. It, it's the God of this world has blinded their eyes. We can't make people see. It is God, uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 4, uh, verse 6, it's God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness that has shined in our hearts to give the light of the, of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Only God can, can, can break through the darkness and bring the light. That's not our job. Our job is not to penetrate the darkness of someone's heart with the light. That's not our job. Our job is to point them to the one that does. That's it. This is what John the Baptist did. And then uh, they, they followed Jesus, these two disciples of John. And Jesus turned and he saw them and he said unto them, What seek ye? And they answered him, Rabbi, which is to say, Master, where dwellest thou? Now when I first read that, it seemed kind of funny to me. What seek ye? Where dwellest thou? They answered Jesus' question with a question. And I thought, well, that was kind of odd. Until you look at that and you realize that they were following Jesus. And it wasn't a what they were seeking, but it was who they were seeking. So when you think about it that way, when Jesus says, what seek you? And they say, where are you? Where do you abide? Where do you dwell? They were seeking Jesus. The prophet Jeremiah tells us, that you shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. They were following the Lord and it wasn't about what. Where are you? Where are you going, Jesus? Because that's where we want to be. And he said unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt. And they abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. Now, you, you notice that that John the Apostle is being very specific in the day, this day, and then the day following, and the day following, and now at this certain time, and we stayed with him. You know that uh, John was all about the he was all about the details, and 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 it just shows us that. That this is, this is God's timetable. Do you realize that our life is in God's timetable? It's His timing and His purpose. 
He has ordained. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works that God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Let him direct your steps. Because it's in his time. And there was a schedule. And Jesus was right on schedule. And they came and they dwelt with Jesus. I, I love how he says, come and see. And it reminds me of the disciples uh, after the resurrection. Remember, uh, on the shore, and Jesus had 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 uh, he had the table spread where the saints of God are fed, and he invites his co- chosen people come and dine. And that's what he that's what he told the disciples. He said, "Come and dine." The invitation is there in Matthew eleven twenty eight. Jesus says, "Come unto me." All ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Come unto me. The invitation. And and they abode with him. And and remember, uh, Jesus, he talks about that he's divine. Uh, We're the branches. and, And we abide in him and he abides in us. Abide with the Lord. Abide with him. Dwell with him. He says, come and see. He says, come and dine. He says, come unto me. All you. All you that love. Are you laboring? Are you broken hearted? Whatever it is, come. Come unto me. Come and see. Come unto me. And it says in verse 40 that one of these two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. And it doesn't name the second disciple, which leads me to believe that this was probably John, the apostle himself. Because John always stayed away. He never identified himself. It would make sense because we see in the other Gospels uh, that that John and James they were they were partners with Peter and Andrew. Uh, I believe it was John. Doesn't matter, but we know one was. We know it was Andrew, and we know that Andrew went to his brother. Verse 41, he first findeth his own brother Simon and said unto him, We have found the Messiah. We have found the anointed one. We have found the Christ. We have found him. Peter, we found him. And here, John the Baptist is not in the scene, is he? The preacher ain't nowhere to be found. Who is this? This is Peter's brother. Peter's brother who has just found the Lord. And what does he go do? He goes and tells his brother, we have found the Messiah. And Andrew, I've mentioned this before, but as you read through, we're going we're to run into Andrew a couple more times as we go through this gospel. But Andrew was always bringing people to the Lord. The, 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 the lad with the, with the five loaves and the two fishes. You know who brought him to Jesus? Andrew. In John 12, when the Greeks came and they wanted to see Jesus, you know who brought those Greeks and Gentiles to Jesus? Andrew. He was just bringing people to Jesus. Not one single sermon is recorded in the Scripture, and I'm sure he preached, but there's not a sermon recorded about Andrew. The only thing that's ever said about Andrew is is he was taking people to see Jesus. He was taking them to Jesus. And the first person he thought of was his brother, Peter. And he went and brought Peter to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas. You know, I don't don't want to get into a lot of this, but but this is uh, the Aramaic word for Petros, which is a stone. 
Uh, uh, it also is the name, Petros is the name Peter. So stone and Peter are interchangeable. But he, he calls him uh, a stone. He calls him Petros. And, and, and remember in, in Matthew 16, he, he says, you are Peter. You are a small stone. And upon this rock, Petra, on this boulder, on this foundation, I will build my church. And, and, and we see a little what, what, what Jesus was describing and, and, and the, and the Roman Catholicism, they took a, they took a left turn at Albuquerque on that one and they've gone nuts. Peter is not the foundation of the church for crying out loud. That's ridiculous. It's Jesus Christ. In second Peter, he says, you and I, we're, we're living stones. We're, we're being built up on, but Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. He's the foundation. We're built upon Christ. If you ain't built upon Christ, you're crumbling. He is the, he is the rock. He's the foundation. We're just those stones that have been made alive by His Spirit. Enough of that. The fourth day of the narrative. Verse 43. Right on schedule. John the Baptist is nowhere to be found, right? The day following this, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip and said unto him, Follow me. So the preacher didn't tell Philip about Jesus, did he? There were no disciples that went to Philip and said, Hey, there's Jesus. Who found Philip? Who went looking for him? The shepherd? The shepherd that left the 90 and 9 and went and found the one lost sheep? That story makes no sense until you're the one lost sheep. Oh, then it makes sense, doesn't it? Then you're thankful. Jesus went and found Philip. Jesus sought out Philip. Oh man, that does something to me. He, he came. He came and He sought me. And he bought me. Luke 19, the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus went looking for Philip. Jesus went looking for me. And, and I don't care how you come to the Lord. And we're seeing all these different ways. Whether it was in church and some preacher and you responded to a message or you had a, or you had a family member that had trusted Christ. Or as we're going to see here in a minute, uh, that Philip goes to Nathaniel, his friend. I don't care how it happens. It's the Lord that has sought us. He seeks and saves that which was lost. And He sought us out. We are here today because the Lord has sought us out and saved us by His marvelous grace. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Philip uh, and Peter. And Philip finds Nathanael. And as I said, his friend Nathanael. And he said to him, We found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And so here we see another way. Just a friend. Just a friend that knows the Lord. Philip says, Nathanael, we found him. Come and see. And Nathaniel said, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? <laughs> I don't think Nazareth was a well thought of place, do you? You know, it was a derogatory statement, I understand that. But at least Nathaniel wasn't being a fake, you know? He was being honest. And of course we know that the Savior, there's nothing uh, that we should behold Him. There, he, was, he didn't come with, with, all the, with all the power and all the, the pomp of a, of a king. No, He came as a servant. He came humble. He humbled Himself. And he was from that dirty little town of Nazareth. And Nathaniel said, Nazareth? Eh, 
I don't know about that. But this is fulfillment of the Scripture. He shall be called a Nazarene. He shall dwell in a city called Nazareth. That's where Mary was. She was in Nazareth when the, when the angel came to her. But he says, can anything good thing come in Nazareth? And Philip, he just says, he repeats the words of the Lord that he'd spoken earlier. Come and see. Come and see for yourself, Nathaniel. You better come. Because we found him. Jesus saw Nathaniel coming to him. Did he know Nathaniel? Was it right on schedule? No, it was in God's time. He looks at Nathaniel and says, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Now, Jesus wasn't saying Nathaniel was perfect, he just wasn't deceitful. Nathaniel was just honest. He was seeking. Because what did Nathaniel do when Philip said, come and see? He went to see, didn't he? He went to find out. And Jesus saw him. And Nathaniel said unto him, Whence knowest thou me? I have never met you before. How do you know my name? How do you know who I am? And Jesus said unto him, before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Uh-oh. <laughs> Ephesians 1 tells us that we were chosen in him before the foundation of the world. So Jesus knew Nathaniel a lot longer than before he was under the fig tree. But here he drives home this point to Nathaniel. And the point is, Nathaniel, I know you. I know who you are. I know everything about you. And Nathaniel, he thought that he was looking for Jesus. But you know what? Jesus had already found him. And then Psalms 139. <laughs> o Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. There's not a word in my tongue, but Lord, thou knowest it all together, that whole psalm. Hey, you know what? We better be honest with God. Because He knows everything about us. He knows our past. He knows our present. And He definitely knows our future. He knows us from beginning to end. Don't play games with God. Be honest. I think about <clears throat> when Jesus healed this sick man of palsy in Matthew 9 and, and, and instead of saying you're whole he says thy sins be forgiven thee. And remember the, the Pharisees they started mumbling and say oh, who's, who's this guy that can forgive sins? You know, Who does he think he is? And then that scripture records that little phrase Jesus knowing their faults, said. <laughs> wow. He knows our faults. He knows everything. We better be honest with him and follow him. And Nathaniel, he answers and says, uh, uh, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. Thou art the King of Israel. So Nathaniel, now the, the doubts have been removed. It's one little simple statement that I saw you under the fig tree. It did it for Nathaniel. Philip said, come and see. Nathaniel said, oh yes, he is. He is the true Christ. And Jesus answered and said, because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. And he said unto him, verily, verily, I say unto you hereafter, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. And I, I think about the encounter of Jacob, Jacob's ladder in Genesis 28. He dreamed and the ladder was to heaven and it, 
and the angels of God were ascending and descending and the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham. You know who that was? That was Jesus. This is the same Lord God of Abraham that says in John 8, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus Christ is God. And he tells Nathaniel, you got that right. I am the Son of God. I am the King of Israel. And you're going to see greater things than these. But for us today, I, again, what can we do in a wicked and perverse world? Darkness all around us. So much evil prevails. Do we just give up? Do we just throw up, throw up our hands and say, what's the use? Come and see. Come and dine. Come unto me. And, and you don't have to be the preacher, do you? It just you have you experienced the grace of God in your life? Have you been born again? Can't you tell a family member that that doesn't know the Lord? Jesus did this for me. Or a friend? A friend at school or at work? Come and see. This is what Jesus did to me. This is what Jesus has done for me. That's all. You, you don't have to be a, a theological uh, professor. You don't have to know it from front to back. I know. I don't. <laughs> no. What's, what's the gospel? It's, it's telling others what Jesus has done for you. Sure, we should know the Scriptures. Absolutely. Grow in grace and knowledge. But man, as soon as you're saved, look, these guys had just met Jesus. And they were pointing others to Jesus. And it's, and it's the work of God. That's all we've got to do. Behold the Lamb of God. Because Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life. That's God's business. That's not our business. In His great intercessory prayer in John 17, the Praying for his disciples, he said, Thine they were, and thou gavest thou me, and they have kept my word. I've given unto them the words which thou gavest me, Father, and they have received them. Jesus called out these disciples that were given to him by the Father. And they came, and they responded, and they followed Jesus. Except later in John 17, in that prayer, he says, I don't just pray for these alone that are here with me, but I pray for all them that will believe on me through their word. So that includes us. We're included in that prayer. Hey, he's given us his word. Have you heard? Have you received? You belong to him. Keep his word. Follow him. Point others to our blessed Savior. Father, thank you for your holy word. Thank you for the promises of your word. Lord, work in each of our hearts. First, that we would just yield ourselves fully to you, to be honest, to confess. As, as Susie sang, lay the broken pieces at your feet. Let you put us back together. And then, Lord, that we would go. Oh, that we would, we would tell others what you've done for us. Not to save them, Lord. No, at your word. No, just to tell them because of the gratitude, of the grace, and the mercy that you poured out on us. <coughs> We would want others to know that I came to Jesus. He saved me.
with us in this verse of invitation, Lord. I pray you would draw each person to you.